inject a little bit of uh, different energy, I'm going to be a little bit of a spoil sport, right? Uh, instead of being in the cheerleader quantum camp, I'm going to show some of the bumps along the way. So how long before quantum computing is useful? Well, if you asked AI experts a few months before DeepMind solved Go, right, they will tell you 10 plus years away. And DeepMind surprised everybody and solved Go. But we also have other examples, right, like nuclear fusion, where people are saying that nuclear fusion is five years away for the last 50 years. Experts are notoriously bad at predicting advancements in their own field especially ones that require some leap, some uh, improvement that is not gradual. Um, so we don't know. Uh, people are talking about ENIAC, right? I think that's a great example. Uh, we have multiple competing technologies today, superconducting, uh, Rydberg atoms, uh, trapped ions, etc. These might all be different types of vacuum tubes, and we might still be work waiting for this transistor that will allow us to take the next step, okay? So we shouldn't be too careful to say, ah, it's like two, three years away. No, no, it might actually be a lot harder. Um, now, we're take, there are kind of two possible branches we can take. One is to make a, a near-term superconducting, a, a near-term quantum computation uh, better, and the other is uh, to do error correction, okay? Now, of course, these two paths interact because if you make your uh, gates better, if you make your qubits better, it'll make the work for error correction better. But one needs to remember, to do useful quantum computing with error correction, we need more than 100,000 qubits, okay? We're at the 100, and these 100 aren't that good. So the road for fault-tolerant quantum computation is long and hard, to the point where I heard people call it fairy tale quantum computation. So I don't think that's uh, uh, fair. I think it's completely doable, but it's a lot harder than some would like you to believe. Now, why am I being not super optimistic like everybody? Because error rates haven't really been improving the same way we've been growing the number of qubits. Uh, if you look here, the 2014, this is the entangling gate error rate, right, or the infidelity. The 2014 is from the John Martinez paper where they introduced the axmons, um, uh, superconducting uh, uh, qubits at the threshold of error correction, it was called. F oh, sorry, five years later, the supremacy result, same error rate. Right? This time it's not the hero qubit, it's the median, but still, same error rate. Okay? They took, Google took 30 million shots. They ran the experiment 30 million times. 99.8% was noise. And 0 0.2 was enough to prove what they wanted to prove. So what they did was completely valid, but the situation isn't that good. And the last one, this is the most recent 120 something device from IBM and the error rate is actually greater, okay? So we're not making as much progress as we would like to. Why? Because the efforts to make quantum computation work is not really scalable. This is a, a graph from a Google uh, presentation. Each little circle is an experiment you need to run, and this whole thing describes what you need to do to calibrate two qubits. The effort required to make just two of these experiments is a PhD, right? So that's like four years or something, right? This is unscalable. Now, the reason it's not Google's fault, it's not that anybody's doing much better, these devices are really, really complex. And each qubit, if you want to describe it accurately, you need something like 100 parameters the qubit, its interaction with the environment, how it responds in the readout, how the control line that gets you from the electronics into the fridge or whatever, how it distorts the signal. There are tons and tons of parameters to measure everything and to calibrate everything so you get your 99.9 .9 accuracy. That's devilishly hard, and we haven't been making progress. 
And this is the observation that underlines Cruz. And we think the solution is just put a machine learning physicist to do some of the job. So imagine instead of having a few PhD students in the lab, you could have an army of 1,000 working 24-7, right? So they're not the more, most senior people. They won't build you a quantum computer from scratch. But now if you have 100 parameters to solve, you have 100 virtual people to, solve, to measure them. And this is the way we make progress. So we start with a quantum computer, and we build a digital twin, a very, very detailed digital twin, not just of the quantum part, but also of all the surrounding electronics, because the effects of the surrounding electronics can impact what's actually happening in the device. Right? Then, based on this digital twin, you do what's known as optimal control theory, and you figure out how do you make the qubit do what you want it to do. And it may be laser fields for trapped ions or uh, uh, microwave fields for superconducting qubits or whatever. Now, because initially the digital twin is not very accurate, you just take it to the experiment and you do a second calibration, a second optimization in a closed loop. Now, okay, and then you get something that kind of sort of works. And this is what we've been doing so far. But this is actually a really, really bad idea. Why? Because if we need to do calibration, we actually prove that the digital twin, the model, is not very accurate. Because if it were accurate, you would need to calibrate. And then you did calibration. Now you have gates that work better, but you don't know why because you don't have a more accurate model of the system, right? And worse than that, let's say I achieved 99.8 fidelity, right? For, which for an entangling gate is considered very, very good. But why not only 99.8? Why don't we have four nines or five nines? We don't know. We haven't learned anything from the calibration, right? That's, that's not good. We're not going to make a lot of progress if we don't understand where our errors come from. It's not just measuring and quantifying the errors, although that's useful. You need to go back to the physics to understand what's actually the source of these errors. So you can focus on improving that aspect of the device in the next iteration of hardware. So this is what we do. We take all the data that we observe during calibration and we feed it back and we do model learning, which is improving the model to best match the data that comes out of the experiment. And we can tell you in standard deviations what's the distance between the model and the data. Uh, now, you can ask, okay, but where's like machine learning in here? Well, it's kind of hidden in here. We just didn't use the, the, right ter the machine learning terminology. So for calibration, you can use reinforcement learning optimizers, which kind of learn from experience. They, they, they're pre-trained on simulation, and then they're kind of learn as they go on your system, so they do the job better and faster. We can do Bayesian optimal experiment design in order to get some data to improve the model. If we see that, for example, there's a parameter in the model which we, we can't kind of narrow down because we don't have the right data, the software can go out and get the right data. Now, the basic approaches, the basic algorithms that we're talking about, we've, we've tested on many systems. Uh, so this is, for example, work we did with IBM Zurich. Uh, I was personally involved in that. This is nitrogen, va nitrogen vacancy centers, uh, sensing. This is MRI. We're now in a project with Envision and, uh, and Siemens looking at that, because that's also quantum, right? MRI is old school quantum, but it's the same sort of equations. And there are other systems here. Uh, so we have version one of our software out. It's currently in operation. Uh, experimentalists like to control their experiments, usually with Jupyter Notebooks and Python. So this is how you would interact with our software. But you also get kind of nice dashboards. You get the Qiskit stack. So you so your quantum device in the lab becomes essentially a Qiskit private cloud, behaves exactly like an IBM cloud would. You just send jobs internally. So that's also very convenient in the lab. You don't need to decide who's using the device right now. You just send a job, you get it back. 
And if you want, you can open a port in the firewall and then it's a global cloud, right? But that's your decision. Um, from our perception of how we see ourselves, we're tool makers, right? So it's your lab, it's your experiment, it's your device. We just give you tools, the equivalent of, let's say, junior physicists in the lab. You can order around and tell them to do what you want, even over the weekend. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Super, thank you, Shai. Any questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, how is this different from a simulator, uh, for example, for a superconducting-based device? Here you're learning, uh, you said you're learning uh, the right. behavior of the quantum computer, right? So, but yeah. is, isn't so, it very inefficient to simulate the effects of a quantum computer on a classical computer? So what are you learning here? What is uh, the okay. learning task? Okay. Thank you. So there is a simulator and a very, very detailed physics level simulator, right? This is not a sim... So there are simulators around that are designed to do, you know, 40 qubit circuits. That's not what's interesting for us. We want to run the Schrodinger equation, the Lindblad equation, and we want to run it very, very detailed on a small number of qubits. Let's say 10 qubits. Because the whole program of quantum computation is based on the assumption that we don't have long-range correlated noises. Right? If we have long-range correlated noises, whether in space or in time, we're screwed. We're never going to get this to work. Right? So. The, the assumption is that a big quantum device can be considered a set of overlapping tiles, each of which is rather small. And if you calibrate and characterize each of these tiles, you get a characterization of the device in its entirety. And one, one can also check whether this assumption is correct. But if it's not, that's kind of like the number one problem that you need to choose because if you have a qubit here and a qubit, you know, like five places away that somehow have correlated noise between them, that's painful and you need to kind of track down where it comes from because that's going to kill your computation and kill any attempt at error mitigation or error correction down the road. Mm -hmm.